it's all a matter of the soul. Mm. You see, the soul, which is not physical, that's who and what we really, really are. And now and then we go into a new lifetime and live that one through and go back into our pure soul state of being knowing about all the other previous lifetimes that we've had. Mm. We don't know that when we're in a body living, but we do know that when we've passed on into the other realm and we're just a very conscious, extremely aware soul, we can look back on all the lifetimes we've had and all mm. the different themes that we've been experiencing and and working on I had the great privilege again of sitting down with the legendary barbara lamb for another interview we discussed many things such as reincarnation her work as a hypnotherapist and particularly about the time that we're living in now this raising of the collective consciousness i think you're going to find this chat informative inspiring and fascinating back in the um 1970s, I was becoming aware of uh, what happens after we physically die, uh, mostly from the work of wonderful Raymond Moody. And I became very interested in that and more and more convinced that we are ongoing, continuing souls. And then we come now and then into these lifetimes. And it seemed like we were coming into these lifetimes for a particular kind of learning, you know, a particular kind of experiencing and learning. And, um, and that that would be sort of contributing to the growth of the soul. So I, I was absolutely fascinated with that. I know by about the mid to late 1970s. And then um, in the early 1980s, I started doing quite a bit of traveling to other parts of the world. And I uh, went to uh, Peru and up at Machu Picchu. Um, I was just walking across the big lawn up there in the middle of that whole complex. And suddenly I just felt like and actually had the sense of remembering that I had been a little girl there long ago with very dark skin and dark straight hair and um, kind of short and chunky. And um, I, I was walking across that lawn, going back to my home. And I could see as I was walking along <clears throat> that there was a stone wall way, way over on my left and kind of an opening like a gate way in that stone wall. And there were just little bits of walls of stone houses still left in there. And uh, after centuries, I imagine, and I knew walking across the lawn that I knew exactly where to go through that opening in the, the wall and then turn left, and then turn right, and the third house on the right was mine. So I actually then, after that sort of, whew, what seemed like a, a real memory, rather than just an imagination, then I actually did walk to that house and felt a tremendous sense of familiarity. Like, oh yeah, this is home. And and then I thought, where did that come from? And then the next day at Machu Picchu, I was climbing that very large peak that you often see in the pictures of Machu Picchu, another huge, very tall sort of conical shaped peak sticking up in the background. So anyway, I was climbing that with a small group of people and I came to one point sort of at the edge of that cliff. And um, 
absolutely froze in absolute terror and I couldn't move. And other people came up past that point and went on up. We all were aiming to climb to the top of that peak, which I really wanted to do. And I had done mountain climbing before. I wasn't afraid of it. I had the stamina for it. And But at that particular point in that peak, I just absolutely froze, as I say, with terror, couldn't move. I, I didn't understand why. I kept reminding myself that I was really okay. And I had climbed steep mountains like that and had done years and years and years of snow skiing on high mountains. So why, why am I so terrified and frozen? Well, finally, my traveling companion came and grabbed my arm and pulled me away from that spot. And I continued up the trail to the top. But it was such a remarkable experience that after I came back home again, I had one of my um, people do a regression, one of my colleagues uh, do a, a regression on me to, I had heard about regressions by that time, didn't, had not ever done any, but I had heard about it and um, found out that I had been in a past life, a young man, dark skin, dark, straight hair, a young guy, maybe around 20 years old. And I had been chased up that mountain peak by an enemy young man who had a big knife in his hand. And as he went to strike me with the knife, I leaned back to get out of the way and fell off the cliff, oh. fell a whole mile down to the Yurubamba River, the rocks around the Yurubamba River. Wow. And uh, so no wonder that was a traumatic place for me. But the remarkable thing for me was that it, um, you know, it struck such terror in me in this life, because that life must have been probably hundreds of years ago. Hmm. So that really got me thinking about these kinds of things, uh, thinking about past lives for the first time, really seriously, thinking about that. Uh, I had heard, as we all do, that uh, many people in the world, especially other parts of the world, uh, believe in reincarnation. I hadn't believed in it. I just thought that was sort of an interesting, rather primitive view. Mm -hmm. um, nothing to do with reality, I thought, <laughs> until these experiences started happening. So then, about three months later, that same year, 1981, I went to Egypt for the first time. And there I had about at least five, maybe six, of what I eventually came to call spontaneous past life recalls. So in other words, I would be in a certain temple or a certain location outside. And suddenly, like it would be like a, a, a wave of memory coming up through me of having been there as a different person long, long ago. Some of those would have been two or 3,000 years ago, uh, those lifetimes. And they were quite detailed. They didn't go on for huge lengths of time, maybe just a few minutes, but still they were very powerful and and very detailed, very impactful. Like I could really relate to that. Like for instance, at this one temple, which is just an outside series of columns at this point, um, I, I was sitting on a stone looking at them, just maybe 15 feet away from them. 
And suddenly I, I remembered, oh yes, I used to, I used to wear this long, long robe and I used to take people through these columns and we'd touch the columns and the columns would help the person to heal. It was something about the vibration of those columns that as we went by them and touched them, and I think we were doing some toning of voice tones too that came up in this recollection. And that, that this was a way of helping people to heal from whatever they had wrong with them. And so that was quite vivid. And then I had, you know, about five others, including being in the uh, king's chamber of the Great Pyramid at Giza. And that uh, I recalled, as our group was there, I recalled in very vivid detail having been a, a dark-skinned, dark-haired woman um, assisting the process of the spiritual initiate who would be lying in the sarcophagus of the king's chamber. Um, I would be assisting in that man who was studying to be a high priest to lift, help lift his soul out of his body. In other words, an out of body experience, astral travel, which was part of the initiation I had learned of, of these priests, that the final initiation was to lie in the sarcophagus of the king's chamber of the Great Pyramid and have an astral travel experience. They believed that the soul would go up to the North Star for a while and then come back into the body. And at that point, the man would be fully initiated to be a high priest. And again, this was, you know, two or 3,000 or more thousand years ago. And I remembered being this sort of priestess sort of woman facilitating that and that I was completely dedicated to it. I even found myself doing these, these big sweeping motions to help the soul leave the body of the man in the sarcophagus. So after our group participated in that, which was before visitors hours in the Great Pyramid. So after that, my group left, but I held back. I wanted to just stay in the King's Chamber longer before any visitors would come in that day. And so I asked my friend, my who is my traveling friend and best friend from many years, uh, uh, to just stay and and just watch, just be a guardian kind of, because I wanted to get into the sarcophagus and lie down in it, I and which I did. And I had an outer body experience. I don't know where I went, but I definitely was not there anymore for a while, about 20 minutes or so. And I could feel myself leaving sort of sinking down out of the backside of my body, even though I was lying on the concrete floor of the sarcophagus and then up and out. And, and then after a while, I was aware that way down below me, there was all this yelling going on. And it attracted my attention and I found myself lowering down to my body. And as I was getting near to my body, I saw flashes of light from this side and yelling from the other side. And I was being hit by something. My body was being hit. So I floated down 
connected with my body, felt the hard granite underneath me. I was back in my body and I opened my eyes and I realized that the flashes of light from over here were two visitors from Germany who had come in. Visitors hours were open by then and they were flashing pictures with a flashlight, a camera with a flash attachment. And then also the hitting that I had been feeling as I re-entered my body was my friend over on the other side with a little strap on her camera reaching down into the sarcophagus, hitting my body and yelling at me, what am I going to tell your parents? <laughs> You've got to come back. <laughs> What's the matter? Why don't you wake up? You know, so that's what that so poor, poor friend. She had not really <laughs> understood about astral travel, no, and I... it really appeared that I just didn't seem to be there, although my body was breathing, but I just could not be roused. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, so that was another. Uh, spontaneous past life recall and then a year and a half later I went back to Egypt with another group of people and had several more of these past life recalls in different locations and one of them was so grievous so tragic um, that I immediately in that place where that happened I just felt, oh, I just felt nauseated and suddenly exhausted, having felt perfectly fine mm. before going into that place. That place happened to be an underground tomb for the bull gods. Uh -huh. There was a time around Memphis in Egypt. I'm not sure of the century exactly. Um, couple of thousand years BC, um, where the people believed that a bull, an actual living bull, uh, was their god. And when the bulls would die, they had to be put into one of these really huge sarcophagi uh, made of thick granite with a big granite lid. So the granite lid itself was, oh, probably, probably weighed at least a ton, maybe more. And uh, we went just innocently <laughs> to visit that tomb, feeling, I was feeling fine. But after just a couple of minutes in that, that tomb where there were the various sarcophagi, um, it was a very interesting place, but I suddenly felt so tired and so nauseous. And I asked a couple of other people near me if they felt any different. They said, no. And so why do I feel like this? Well, we finally, we walked all around these sarcophagi and went and then around the other side. Oh, suddenly I had a, a very vivid memory from, you know, probably a couple thousand years ago, at least. Um, and of my dear friend, a young man at that time, I was a young man too. My, di my dear, my best friend in that whole life was being crushed by the fallen lid of one of those sarcophagi because the bull had suddenly died and we had to get him as soon as possible into the sarcophagus and put the lid on top. Yeah. So anyway, it turned out that we were slaves and my friend was being a fellow slave, was being crushed beneath that lid and uh, was just sort of slowly dying in misery. Mm. And, um, I was trying to pull the lid off, which I couldn't do, 
by myself. It would have taken a lot of us <laughs> to pull that off. And the slave owner, the slave driver was whipping me mm -hmm. on my back as I was bent over trying to help my friend and watching him die. So anyway, it was it was a terrible tragedy. And to the extent that after we came out of that cave, that uh, uh, underground tomb, I should say, um, I just realized that I needed time alone and to process that. We got on a train to go down to Luxor and uh, I told my traveling companion, just go into the club car and have some drinks and have dinner and enjoy yourself with the others. I just need time alone in our compartment. So I did for about two hours. I just cried and sobbed and processed that. And I kept thinking, you know, if this was my imagination, I, I would not be crying like this mm -hmm. and sobbing and, and getting more and more details of that life coming up. So that was sort of the climax of these kinds of experiences that turned out to be very important leading to what I've been doing all these recent years. So anyway, after coming home again, I, I kept thinking that I, well, I knew I was already a licensed psychotherapist with a regular therapy practice. And I kept thinking, you know, these past life things, I wonder if there's some way that this could be used therapeutically as, as part of my practice. And then, let's see, that was 1983. So in the springtime, um, by the fall, a few months had gone by, and one day, I don't know why, but in around four o'clock in the afternoon, I went into our family room at home and turned on the television. And even while doing it, I thought, why am I turning on the television? I never have watched television in the day or had any possible desire to. So why am I turning it on? Well, I, I look back and think that was really, really guided because my everyday mind would not have done that. But when I turned on the television, right there on that very screen was a program with a woman who was doing past life regressions on a group of people in a workshop. I had not ever heard of past life regressions before that moment, but she was doing that and taking these people in her workshops uh, back to a number of different lifetimes. And then after they would come out of it, they would write down on paper um, things like, what was the transportation? What was the weather? What was the topography? What were the houses and so forth? And um, so she was doing a study about past lives, not as a therapy, but as a study. And as I watched that, I thought, I could do that. That would be really natural and easy for me to do because I had very often before that um, help people to get very deeply relaxed and take them into some of those deeper states for realizing certain things that they needed to realize. And so that was very inspiring. And then a year later, almost exactly a year later, I met the woman who had founded the Association for Past Life Research and Therapies based in Riverside, California. I lived 45 minutes away from that location. So anyway, she suggested I go to the conference of this group of people 
uh, this association was made up of licensed psychotherapists of various types from all over the United States. And, uh, you know, very reputable, decent psychotherapists, uh, thoroughly trained and licensed. And um, I went to the first night of the conference of Friday night. It was only an hour away from me. So that was easy. And I was so impressed that I stayed for the whole weekend and then signed up for their training. Mm -hmm. so impressed with the other therapists and the work that they were doing and the helpfulness that that was for the people they were working with. So I was very inspired, so excited to discover that there is such a thing and, and training in it. So I signed up for training and actually took five years of training as it turned out. And then that eventually led into my working with people who had had not only past lives, but other people who had had experiences with extraterrestrial beings. So that's how that opened up for me in 1991. And I've been doing, you know, thousands of those regressions to extraterrestrial encounters since mm -hmm. then. Yeah. So it's wonderful how sometimes things happen in our lives and we we don't realize what they're going to lead to. Uh, we know that, as in my case, we know that they're very impactful. They really make an impression. Uh, but we don't know what it's going to lead to. So for me, it's been just a very interesting journey, uh, which has led me to what I've been doing for so many years now and will continue to do. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah just, inc I incredible I story. I wanted to ask you the method that you use and have used all these years. Did you develop or refine the method in your own way, or is that what you studied all those years ago? Well, all those years ago, uh, we were directing it all to uh, past lives. Mm. That is, uh, we would talk with the person and find out what their concern was about themselves and their lives. And then we would go back to the source of whatever that concern was. Like, for instance, if somebody uh, had a sense of worthlessness, you know, a very low opinion of themselves, and yet there didn't, other people would say, well, you shouldn't feel that way. Mm. You know, I'm, you're perfectly okay but the person might still feel that way, no matter what anybody else said. So it would be like one of those things that lingered on year after year. Uh, so we would do a regression going back to the source of that feeling of worthlessness to continue this example. And um, very often that the source of that would be in what certainly seemed to be a, a previous lifetime that the person knew it was him or her, but still might even be a different gender and in a different time and place and, and environment and a whole different situation. Uh, so, and in fact, that's always been very interesting when a man is regressed and he realizes that in a previous lifetime, he was a woman. <laughs> yeah. For me, um, I've had several lifetimes that I have been regressed to where lo and behold, I was a male. <laughs> and then which, which actually is very useful because I think that uh, like one of those time, one of those regressions, I was a big 
fur trapping man in the, I think it was probably Northern Canada. Uh, sometimes we don't get the exact location or the, the name of the place, but we can put two and two together later on and think, well, that looks, that sounds like the North Woods there. Anyway, very cold, very snowy. And I'd be out trapping by myself with a big fur coat on from some of the the skins I had, the animals I had trapped. And um, very, very interesting to me, you know, what I thought about my wife and my children and what I expected to experience when getting home to our log cabin out in the wilderness back to my my wife the wow <laughs> that is really interesting <laughs> and um and i'm sure men benefit from having a past life recall or past life regression uh to being a female is that we can understand each other better yeah. now in life which is really very helpful i think <laughs> Yeah. Absolutely. So, so anyway, um, many of those regressions, if we go to the source of a particular problem that a person has, uh, sometimes these regressions take us back to earlier in this life, like like with the example of a feeling of worthlessness, um, the person might have developed that earlier in this life in the, in the home life or maybe school life um you know certain things occurred and they developed that feeling so the point is that wherever the source of the problem is that then now that we have found out where it is uh, then we do a process to try to release that so I think each of us past life regression therapists has probably developed our own particular way um, that we uh, release that before the session is over. Mm. And with a lot of suggestions toward the end, post-hypnotic suggestions, um, that the person will now be free of that feeling of worthlessness and will go on feeling uh, that he or she is a, a, a perfectly good, worthy justification for being here and going on with life. Mm -hmm. So that's where it's a therapy, yes. you see, not just finding out, but, but the therapeutic application of it to release the person from being stuck with those awful feelings. And of course, um, we could do these regressions for any reason at all. Like, why do I feel so attracted to that man? <laughs> and I don't want to do anything about it because I'm married to a perfectly good man. But that one over there, I'm just so drawn to. Mm -hmm. And and then we find out very often in these regressions that they had been in a very, very important relationship in a previous life. Mm. And just getting a little, a little bit of continuation of knowing each other, but not to the extent that they had in the previous life. And sometimes we realize in these, those kinds of regressions that the, whatever the dynamic was between those two people in the previous life, in some ways that gets, thinking of a few situations right now, in some ways that gets reflected in this life mm. without being as encompassing. Mm. In the, and, and then it seems to, to get in touch with that in the regression means that whatever is going on now between the person I'm regressing and that person uh, just seems to smooth out, dissipates. 
So, or it could be that, you know, you you meet someone and immediately you really like that person. Could be like for you, a fellow man, and for me, it could be a fellow woman. And you just wonder, T, why do I just like that person so awfully much? And if you do a regression on that, it usually would <laughs> turn up that you had had a very important, wonderful relationship with that person who was a different person, of course, in a previous lifetime. So it's all a matter of the soul. Mm. You see, the soul which is not physical, that's who and what we really, really are. And now and then we go into a new lifetime and live that one through and go back into our pure soul state of being, knowing about all the other previous lifetimes that we've had. Mm. We don't know that when we're in a body living, but we do know that when we've passed on into the other realm and we're just a very conscious, extremely aware soul, we can look back on all the lifetimes we've had and all the different themes that we've been experiencing and, and working on, mm -hmm. hopefully leading to some development. Yeah. So it, <laughs> it seems like life of the soul can be kind of going up, you know, better, 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 better. You're a better person, better person. And then maybe you have another lifetime where you sort of dip down a bit. Mm. Mm. And maybe another lifetime, a little better, 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 better. But it's all for growth of the soul, mm. these lifetimes. Yeah. Now, we don't have that perspective, do we, when we're in a life like we are right now well we the veil comes down and we forget we forget who we are beyond the physical form what do you think the purpose of forgetting the veil coming down and forgetting who we are what's the purpose in your opinion i think there's a very strong purpose um in other words if we could remember even one previous lifetime, let alone maybe hundreds that we've had, mm. we would be just totally distracted from living this life. Mm. So I think that the veil is very important so that we can really be here and do what we do and learn what we learn, grow the way we can grow. Uh, hopefully grow rather than yeah. slipping back um, <laughs> <laughs> and you know really really live a life with most of our awareness right here living the life we'd be just totally blitzed out if we were distracted by remembering all of that yeah well then, it keeps us focused doesn't it when we're you know, yeah. when we feel like this is it, and a lot of people have that feeling, this is probably all I'll ever have. They, they well, that's what I thought. Yeah. Before, before getting into all this, totally. You know, and we hear this a lot in the culture. I think we hear, you know, you've got, well, you only live once. Once. <laughs> you only yeah. have one life. So yeah. go for it or whatever, you know, Make it work. and, uh, <laughs> and uh, I know in that big uh, musical production of Hamilton recently, one of the themes that kept coming up from, I, I guess it was the character Hamilton, which is, uh, I've got one shot. Yeah. Which is only one shot. You know, that, that phrase yeah. It was repeated throughout that production. So, I mean, in other words, do it now. I've got only one chance. Yeah. But I'm sure that the perspective of that character was that there's not only one shot in this life, but this is the only life. So mm. make it count. You Have know? you found in your work that if if one person perhaps uh, 
doesn't learn a particular lesson in an incarnation that they tend to come back and repeat the same set of circumstances again um, to you. try to get it right. Great, great question. Yes. Mm. Yes, I do. I do. So it, it could be a certain kind of challenge or a certain kind of circumstance, or it could be getting it straight with a certain person. Mm. Like, like somebody might have been your mother in a previous lifetime and you just were always up and against her and you know, and then and then that person might be your daughter in this lifetime, just as an example. Yeah. Yeah. And the dynamic would be different, but you'd still have the opportunity to play it out a better way. You know, to and for both to learn something really good and important. Yeah. Yeah. It could be more of a set of circumstances. You're in business in one lifetime and you didn't do very well at all you missed a lot of opportunities and you were kind of lazy didn't pay much attention to it and in this life you have another chance because you might be in business again <laughs> but yeah. you have an opportunity to do it differently mm -hmm. <laughs> these are just yeah examples. to do it again Apples. One imp one important question I wanted to ask you is if the, through your 40 plus years of investigation and work and uh, speaking to people's higher awareness or higher self or subconscious, what understanding have you formed of what many call traditionally God or the creator or universal consciousness? What's your personal understanding that you've come to of what that force is oh you are just asking wonderful profound <laughs> questions <laughs> i'm respecting them very much <laughs> actually i think more than anything i have learned more from the people involved with extraterrestrial beings because what they learn from the beings they have encounters with, and all of this comes out in the regressions, otherwise we wouldn't know it. Uh, what, what they realize from the beings that they have encounters with is that from the, the extraterrestrial beings perspective, uh, they know that, well, well they don't have um, a specific godhead like we humans tend to do certainly nothing anthropomorphic yeah like like many people have that idea of god he's sort of like a a big one of us yeah better stronger more powerful more mighty but um and always tends to be a male doesn't he in our culture and yeah like, <laughs> <laughs> and in the last 30 or 40 years, I think, uh, there have been many women, at least in United States, who have been saying, no, wait a minute, this isn't fair. We've left out the divine feminine. Mm. We need to bring that back. Mm. And I think that that's one of the um, important aspects of the Catholic faith is the emphasis on Mary. Yes, um, Mary is, is the divine feminine. I was not brought up Catholic, but um, I definitely have respect for that. Anyway, more than anything, I find myself influenced by the ET human hybrids, whom I know and have worked with and written a whole book about meet the hybrids, the lives and missions of ET ambassadors on earth. So with Miguel Mendonca, that, that, that book. So th these hybrids who 
are living with us as regular people, but they have a good deal of extraterrestrial genetics in them, that they have had so much contact with their extraterrestrial creators and friends, colleagues, actually, that their understanding, because of these beings, is that God is the one great creative source, the source of everything mm -hmm. and everyone all throughout the cosmos, the, that God presence, consciousness, energy is the creator and sustainer of all of the universes mm. and all the dimensions. Mm. So their understanding, these extraterrestrial beings spoken to the hybrid people here, uh, their understanding is that we are all one. Now we think we humans here on planet Earth, we think in terms of separateness. We think our planet is totally separate from any other planet way, way, way out there. We're separate from the sun, from the moon. And every one of us here on this planet are separate from each other. And when you really think about it, that's emphasized a lot, at least in this country, about be an individual, be yourself, go your own way, create your own path, you know, separate, 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 separate political parties, separate sports teams, se separate institutes of education, this school against that school. Um, I mean, really, when you look at it, there's an awful lot of that, at least in the Western world. Mm -hmm. And um, that individuality is emphasized so much in individual freedom. And, and that's good. I am not against a lot of that. But I think we really need to realize that even though we emphasize those things, we are all one with everyone and everything and everywhere mm. so that that has been a wonderful influence on me to think more in those terms so when i go out and around and i see let's say a homeless person or anybody and I would have always thought, you know, that person has nothing to do with me mm. or just people in the supermarket, you know, totally separate lives, going our own individual way with our own wagon. <laughs> but um, now I, I find myself thinking about other people Oh, that's another aspect of me, uh, because we are all one. That's just being expressed in a different way than I am expecting my part of the overall one. Yeah. It's a more tolerant view, I think. It reminds so me of what we hear from Jesus who, who said, you know, love thy neighbor as yourself. I wonder if that was that wisdom that he was, uh, you know, communicating at the time. Yes. Yes. Thank you for bringing that up. I do believe so that he just said it in ways that we people would be able to relate to better. Mm. Mm -hmm. you know because we all have a neighbor <laughs> mm. yeah well actually why we're on the subject of jesus uh, i know 
Dolores Cannon wrote two books on the subject. What What's your understanding of this Christ figure, this Jesus figure from, from your own personal uh, viewpoint as well as maybe the sessions that you've done? Yeah. Um, well, I grew up in a, a pretty liberal Protestant <laughs> tradition and um, always had... Um, a very special, favorable feeling and opinion about Jesus and um, always was grateful for that. I mean, I thought how wonderful, how absolutely wonderful that Jesus came into the world and did what he could to help out and to influence the way people think and and treat each other and so so that's been part of my life um somewhere along the line after i got involved with the extraterrestrial work i found myself thinking that you know what i i bet that jesus is so much more encompassing than we can imagine and that he came here as a person back in those days when he came when the world really needed it there's a lot of very unfortunate stuff going on and um he he came and then i bet that he at other times, he takes a different form, like what we would call an extraterrestrial form, and lives on one of those other planets to help whatever that civilization is all about. And that overall, he is part of this great creative source maybe closer to the source than the rest of us ever get, yeah. including the extraterrestrials. They're more in real relation to it, more connected with it, more a spokesperson for it. Uh, so that he, um, at different time periods, he's a different kind of physical being for a while and and does what he can to help you know wherever he is to help whatever that civilization is to live much more lovingly and decently together so i don't know if that's true but i like that idea 